Hello and welcome to the Bout of Insanity podcast. You are listening to episode 6. Last episode, episode 5, was my first collaboration. It was between... I was talking with a good friend and... uh, I guess now, colleague. Technically, sort of. He, uh... He basically keeps an eye on me and makes sure I don't mess everything up, which is quite, quite commonplace. Yes, but uh, Luke Alex, I was uh, talking with him for approximately, I think an hour and a half, largely about mythology. Now this episode is going to be a lot more controversial than mythology and talking about magical horses and uh, magical dogs. So, be warned if you came here from that video. This will be largely about... Well, I, I suppose it is more historical than political, but it's... Especially in recent years, it's quite politically charged. But I, I I think I should start my world view of history and what I will what I mean by that is for example the Marxists uh, uh believe that or at least ninety nine percent of them, otherwise they wouldn't be Marxists, believe that history has been propelled all throughout all throughout it, between two classes, the oppressor and the oppressed. Let me just read you a page from it, or a quote, sorry. 1. Bourgeois and proletarians. The history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. So obviously, first sentence, it, well, first actuals, uh, sentence in, because the other one is just a little footnote. Freeman and slave, pa- pa- <laughs> patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guild master and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to, n- to one another, carried on an, un- an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open, fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. Now, I have to give it to him, Karl Marx. See, he's a good writer, unlike another infamous political uh, extremist who wrote who wrote a book. It is quite well written because it does actually start to convince you as you keep writing it or reading. Sorry, because of course, although Friedrich Engels is on the cover, he largely was just a. Uh, he largely just helped Karl Marx as a friend and financially throughout the Communist Manifesto. Because although he was a communist thinker himself, he only put a lot of his own work into Das Kapital, the capital, which is the main work, which I I don't have, actually. I don't have Das Kapital, any of the volumes. Which is probably for the best, considering I haven't even finished the Communist Manifesto, which has 32 pages <laughs> in about two, three years. And I'm only about 30 pages into Mein Kampf. But, you know, those two uh, books or two figures, they're, they're more similar than people give them credit for, most people. Because a lot of the stuff Karl Marx has said, you start to 
uh, kind of <laughs> gets a bit uneasy. Not only because he sometimes makes a bit of sense uh, in what he's saying, but also just of a pure anti-Semitism, which gets spouted out of him, which I think is largely as a product of his time. I've got this quote here. Huckstrian. What is his worldly god? Money. Money is the jealous god of Israel, in face of which no other god may exist. And that's by Karl Marx. So, yes. Woke uh, polit politician, political figure he was not. He's very anti-Semitic. Just because woke people... I, I don't really like that word. Woke. Because it originated from people making... Or, no, it sort of originated online of people calling themselves it and then later people made him fun of it and now it's a mainstream political word so yeah and then there's Mein Kampf where Hitler says that uh, the bourgeoisie uh, encourages uh, working people to be patriotic but the working people can't be patriotic anymore because they've been stolen by the bourgeoisie. I, that's not an actual quote, but it's something along those lines. I haven't read it in a while. Now, I'm trying not to make this episode about whether National Socialism was real socialism, which is one of my points from day one, but I still haven't gotten round to... Uh, to to make it. Now, I'll tell you what, I'll make, episode, uh, I'll make next episode, episode 7, into that, because I'll need to research it, because I haven't done it for a while. But, uh, yes, anyway, where was I? Oh yes, my, my historical world view, sort of. Now, I sort of, I think I touched on it a while ago, on my sort of world view and the creation of history, sort of. Now, I think that way back, <laughs> back in the olden days, I'm getting really technical here, I think nations formed around culture or shared values. Now I think these nations later became nation states or sort of at the same time sort of uh in in what liberals would say classical and modern would say that a sort of social contract was formed where the state was set up, therefore people uh, forfeiting some of their rights for protection. And that's what I think happened with the creation of nation states, that, that people set up a state based on the shared cultural values and all of the people within that, say, tribe, family, small community, uh, the state was set up to defend against uh, enemy nation states. And eventually, of course, they became countries that we'd recognise, recognise it, not just very small people. Uh, very small peoples into massive empires, kingdoms, everything else. Now I think that these nations warred with each other almost naturally because they want to take uh, other, re other uh, countries or nations' resources, their slaves 
there. Uh, just tactical positions they wanted there, artwork they wanted there, land in general. And of course, that just set off multiple wars with each other. All of the small uh, states were just uh, bulldozed over and then were lost to history. But the big ones, they fought other small ones, created these massive states, super states, and they fought with each other. Sometimes winning, sometimes losing, but ultimately never, never quite managing to crush the others uh, immediately. Now, I do think that they all ultimately collapse, collapse in on themselves. And that sort of reminds me of something a bit a bit off topic but saying how for example the empire in star wars could never exist or the republic could never exist because it's simply too big like the galactic empire it's they're just too big to even manage let alone actually have an empire over and that's what you see with like a the Mongolian Empire, they took loads and loads of land, one of the largest in history. Um, but then, when when people actually started to revolt, they, they were so overstretched that they just had to withdraw. That's my understanding of it. Same sort of, of Nazi Germany, there was a massive, la a massive shortage of men, as per or workers, especially since they didn't agree with sending women to work, which is a bit stupid if they're... If you need people to work, and there's a load of poor women who are very passionate about the Nazi cause, because let's not forget that the Nazis always had support from women. And that's... that even surprised uh, historians and political uh, experts at the time, one being from America, he paid a lot of his own money to get a big report on the Nazi party, especially during the 20s, early 30s. And what he got back was that there were a lot of women who supported him, or supported the Nazi cause. Now, I don't really know why. I mean, it's... Weimar Germany was spawned out of Imperial, uh, Imperial Germany, the Kaiser, right? So, obviously, people are going to be a lot more conservative, especially for women. But there's a difference between being conservative and being a Nazi, as some people choose to ignore. But, yes, there was a massive shortage of basi basically everything after they conquered Europe. Apart from Britain, of course. Uh, once they took over France and the Lowland countries and the Scandinavian countries, they just sort of didn't have enough men, enough oil, enough resources to manage all of them and defend all of them. So, allied, later allied invasions were a lot easier if uh, compared to what it would be if they had a surplus of men. God, imagine that. Uh, but I say that, uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, the, the Nazi German armies actually outnumbered the Soviet armies for the first uh, year or two of Operation Barbarossa. So the idea that Stalin just thought, ah, oh, 
but men are ext uh, expendable. Just keep hammering uh, soldiers against the lines, just making them run blindly until we win. That's not true in most of the cases. Most of them. Now, where was I? Oh yes, the, the nations will ultimately collapse. And, you know, that even the most mighty of empires, the Romans, the Greek, the Egyptians, they all collapse. And there's a lot of debate about what, what made them collapse and whether you can and what causes a civilization to fall, but uh, I think it's largely because they've overstepped and they have too many people uh, to control and eventually people get fed up with them and, and mixed with other reasons or logistics or political infightings they can't uh, defeat them and eventually get thrown out of a land which most of the time they shouldn't have been there. So, yes, and, you know, only recently did we come out of the cycle of war, I believe, and seeing it as a glorious thing, because, you know, at the start of World War One, they thought, oh, I'll be home by Christmas and come back a hero. Well, they did come back as a hero, but uh, it wasn't too glorious for them, especially after being uh, pretty much rejected by their own country, which they fought for for so many years. Which was one of the mo one of the more prominent reasons why Labour won in nineteen forty five especially or even though the Conservatives had Winston Churchill they, they were just tired of the lack of social change which was promised uh first by the Liberals in nineteen eighteen. So Yes, don't, don't uh, take voters for granted, especially nowadays, because it's happening more and more, uh, particularly on the left, I think, where they think, oh, the working class, they have to vote for us, or minorities, or minorities, whether it be racial, or religious, or social like LGBT they have to vote for us because we're uh, left wing but does that happen? I mean most Hispanics voted for Trump in 2020 and I think it was about 50-50 in 2016 when it came to Hispanic votes but then again I think 80% of blacks voted for Barack Obama so, yeah, you can't just take votes for granted because, you know, there's some, or I say some, quite a sizable number of working class people who are genuine capitalists and want the government off their backs in America, so they vote Republican. And more recently in in the UK, 2019, uh, the referendum, oh, sorry, <laughs> see it just slips out, the election was basically a referendum on Brexit. And so what did a lot of working class people do? They voted Conservative, many for the very first time. Not just them, but their entire constituency, one of which Oh, I've, I've forgotten which one. I think it was with, uh... Oh. Oh, what's his name? Dennis Skinner. What's his constituency? 
I should probably know this. Of course, he's not an MP anymore. Dennis Skinner constituency. Bolsover, the beast of Bolsover, as he was known. But they turned, uh, they turned conservative over Brexit and how Labour was uh, seen as a Remain party for most people, which was more of an issue for them than the others of that election. So I believe it was most the 2019 election was mostly a single issue election. And really, thank God there was just a, a decisive result. Imagine if it had been another Hun parliament and neither side had a clear majority. God, I mean, where would we be at the moment? And then again, where would we be if Jeremy Corbyn had an 80-seat majority? I, I joked a while back that uh, if we were... If we had become socialist under a conservative government over the coronavirus, and I mean that by, uh, like, nationalisation of the railways and protectionism in trade. I don't mean socialism is when the government does stuff and makes you stay at home. I, that's not socialism. Uh, but yes, if we had an actual socialist in power, we would probably be in a, a communist state by by uh by the time the coronavirus came along and obviously I don't mean that before I I look like an idiot uh, I know it's a joke trolled uh now where was I I was talking about elections not taking people for granted but what does that have anything to do with my World view of history. Oh, I don't know. I've I've forgotten now. But I do not think. Or oh, sorry, I do think that religious or social change is largely inevitable as time goes on and as civilizations go on. Because even if you look at the very old civilizations, say ancient Egypt, they they weren't the exact same fr uh, from their inception to their fall. They weren't exact, the exact same socially, and same with every, every other civilization. So, I think largely it's over education, like, oh, what a surprise, as soon as uh, more people are given education, they want out of the feudal system and they want more more democracy and more uh, liberties. Wow, that's... I could never guess that. <laughs> like... The, uh, oh, the Enlightenment, that's it. The Enlightenment, it's... I quite like it, but... There's not a lot of uh, good YouTube documentaries on it, which is the only way how I learn history. I, as you could probably guess from earlier, I don't read much, but yes. Uh, or if I do, it's at short amounts of time. So, so yeah. Uh, So I think, yes, largely the world is shaped by war and conflict, not by... And I've, I think it's a shame that people didn't start cooperating much sooner. And I mean cooperating, not uh, forcing people to adopt certain lifestyles. <laughs> uh or, or anything else. So, I think that does that 
uh, one, uh, it's a bit confusing, and I lost myself along the way, but, you know, I'm a history YouTuber, I suppose, I have to be a bit balmy, don't I? Now, I think it's time to go on to my next topic, which I planned would be the, uh, the only other one, but we'll see how it goes. I'm only about 26, 25 minutes by the time I cut this out, or like all of the mistakes out, which there's a lot of them. Uh, whether imperialism was a good thing, because especially recently, uh, with Black Lives Matter or whatever, people are trying to distort history in both directions. Trying to make out, oh, it was, it was good in the past, uh, it, like, you know, we weren't actually racist at all, or people don't actually know we were very racist and we still are, when neither of are necessarily true. Notice how I said necessarily, so I, I'm still somehow uh, standing on the fence. Ah, the true power of a centrist. Now, uh, now it's quite absurd for me to say was imperialism a force for good, and I think me being a quote colonizer, even though it wasn't me who did it, bloody hell. See a lot of particularly uh, communist people saying that, like, you know, white people are colonizers, and especially the British, God, uh, they better hide if they're at a bloody communist rally and they're not a communist. You're, you're considered bloody, almost said uh, Mao, but of course they like Mao, don't they? So... Uh, you're considered... Hmm. Oh, I don't know. Who's a bad man? Who's a bad colonizer throughout history? Oh, uh, oh, Genghis Khan. You're the Genghis Khan of, uh, to, uh, communists if you're white, British, and not a communist. Like... You just have to hide. <laughs> but, yes, it is. Uh, going to base my arguments and influence it a lot. A lot, because I wasn't born in a country which just came out of colonisation. Now, yeah, people go, oh, well, we were colonised by the Romans and the Normans and the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons and uh, Celts before them and at war with uh, France and everything. But, you know, that's almost ancient history. Like, come off it. It's not exactly the same, is it? Like, your grandfather or your grandmother wasn't a slave. As, oh, what's her name? Michelle Obama. I think her grandmother was a slave, say, so, or a freed slave. That's how close it is to the modern day. You know, I'm not about this. Oh, America has and always is racist because I don't think it is. There's on a, obviously a lot of good uh, Americans out there. But to say that, oh, it's nothing to do, or racism has nothing to do with modern American society, well, it does. Do you think it's a coincidence that a lot of quote-unquote black neighbourhoods are very poor, uh, and they're in the exact space where segregation 
uh, segregated like housing would have been, which were uh, poorly housed and poorly governed on purpose. Do you think that has anything to do with modern uh, modern poverty if it's based along those lines? Well, I would. Like, police brutality. People say, oh well, mo more white style of police brutality than blacks. Well, alright then, that's worse because it's bloody indiscriminate police brutality. What sort of free world are you living in where the police are, are killing a their own civilians and people defend it because they don't kill only a certain amount of people. Like bloody hell, Americans are. They're, they're something else, I must say. Now, so yes, uh, whether imperialism is a force for good. Now, I would say industrialization does help people whether we like it or not like Karl Marx saying that uh, that the lives of pe of ordinary people has uh, gotten considerably worse since the industrial revolution of course he wrote during it during its infancy might I add but you know, when he talks about the canalisation of rivers and how it's a terrible thing, I'm, I'm, I have to disagree because it's almost like he prefers feudalism over capitalism because at, at least the bourgeoisie doesn't exist because there's no economic freedom. That's, that's the gist of what I, of what he's saying. When he talks about how, uh, about how things in the past never used to be as bad uh, to him, even though the the uh, uh, daily cons consumption of bread and meat went up for everyone during the Industrial Revolution. Yes, or although there were. Uh, workers' rights abuses, obviously, and although rich people got very, very rich from uh, largely exploiting people and uneducated people, a lot of poor people got richer as well. Like, it's not just one way or another. Like, uh, poor people in first world western uh, countries today and I don't mean like ho homeless people but just generally poor people it is poverty yes and they do not have a lot of uh, luxuries and it's, it's definitely something which I feel passionate about and something which does need a change but do I think that they would have been better off without capitalism. Well, no, not necessarily, because they do, they can at least afford a television. Some of them have internet. Some of them have mobile phones. You know, they can afford food, at least. They can, maybe not very healthy food, but they can afford food, but, you know, they can. If they wanted to buy healthy food, they most of the time they could. They can afford cigarettes. They can afford alcohol. They, you know, they can af afford to go out once in a while. Uh, but yeah, that I think that's largely due to the social improvements, which happens partly due to capitalism. Like there's no getting uh, getting around it. It's, you know, if, put it this way, if Karl Marx was true in saying that uh, capitalism was, was in crisis and it was bound to implode on itself in one point and have the 
weapons which uh, the bourgeois summoned out of the ether world will be the same weapons which the working class will use to destroy it. Which is, I think, a quote in there. I, I haven't remembered it correctly, obviously, but... Yeah, that would have happened by now, don't you think, after 150 years or so? It would have, you know, imploded by now. Like, people say, oh, well, we need to educate the working class so they realise they get a class consciousness. Well, now the, now the working class are educated, and has there been a communist revolution everywhere? No, not yet. Like, when when is it going to happen, then? They, Marx, uh prophesized that after a massive war there would be a global communist uh, communist workers uprising and yes after world war one there was communist uh, tensions all across the world and especially in russia where the first successful socialist state was uh was uh, set up not necessarily set successful, but I mean, the first state was set up successfully. But did that happen globally? No. And did the lives of many people necessarily uh, get better? Because, yeah, all right, during like the sort of 50s to 80s and 90s, yeah, people's lives did increase. Uh, like, their livelihoods did increase, and they were better, had better lives during the so Soviet regime as time went on. But, you know, in the 20s, people in Russia were starving to death. You know, in America, they had their own problems. They had... Uh, terrible gut French in poverty, but people weren't starving to death in common practice. There weren't famines in America in the 1920s. And the Soviets were racist, just as everyone else was at the time. Of course, America was and remains backwards, but, you know, that's America, <laughs> really. I'm I'm not a huge fan of them or capitalism, but you know you can't blame everything on on capitalism as a lot of them seem to do, like blaming coronavirus on blaming the coronavirus on capitalism, which actually, on reflection, I sort of get because I do think that without globalization, it wouldn't have spread nearly as quickly, and it probably wouldn't even be in many nations. So yeah, I suppose so, but then again, is globalization, does it have to be capitalist? No, if, this, if the communists got their way, they would have a globalized uh, uh, world, and they would, there would be only cooperation with no nation states at all so you know you can't really blame capitalism for that one i think what was i even going on about i just sort of talked about communism for a while i have no clue what i was Oh yes, industrialization, that's it. It does help people. Yes. Now, when people say industrialization, they largely think, you know, industrial revolution plus, but, you know, the Romans, if they did build all the roads and everything else, uh, they, would, they would have helped the people of Europe if they weren't enslaved, which many of them were, since the Roman economy, like so many others, was based around slavery, and they had to 
keep getting more spoils of war and more slaves to keep the economy growing. That's just how, how it was in the ancient world. But for the people which weren't enslaved or murdered or taxed into oblivion, <laughs> their, their lives would have gotten better like the famous what have the Romans ever done for us scene. It's really, it, it does, uh, it speaks a lot about imperialism as a time, like people saying, what has, have the colonizers ever done for us? And then those same people start bringing up all the positive things they've done, like the aqueduct, the roads, the wine, and then they say peas at the end. But, you know, they did, really. You can't get away from it, where industrialization does help people. Because even today, you know, people are saying, oh, we should get rid of, uh, uh, you know, carbon emitting, uh, uh, like, staple industry. And we should tax more on petrol and... Like, say, sugar, for example. Who does that hit the most? It doesn't hit the working... No, sorry. It doesn't hit the upper and the middle classes, whether the petrol is uh, 20 pence or a pound uh, more expensive, nearly as much as it hits the working classes. I mean, remember back a few years ago where there, there were those Paris riots... That doesn't narrow it down very well because it's France, but but that spawned from President Macron trying to impose more tax onto petrol and diesel, which, you know, does harm the earth, but it keeps a lot of the working class going. You know, I remember back when I had to do some debate thing and we were sorted into teams by other people and they were like right you discuss whether global warming is more important than homelessness you debate whether or uh, side with homelessness and I think I was the only one who genuinely believed in homelessness being more of an issue because you know uh, and CO2 emissions it's only a first world issue you know, third world and poorer countries, they don't care how many, car how much carbon dioxide they're pumping into the atmosphere because they need it. You know, first world countries, they have the most uh, ecological uh, regulation in the world. Like, oh yeah, we can close down, we can make it illegal to have petrol cars and we are only going to have electric cars. Not only does that is that inconceivable, but let's say it is. Rich people could just buy another electric car. Middle class people were middle to middle upper class people. They could at least wait, like a few months and then buy a new one. But working class people, they have no hope in getting an electric car within a few months. Especially if they have, if they're not, uh, like if they're having other problems, which, you know, they would, uh, they can't afford to keep up with these very dare I say, liberal ideas. But it's not necessarily a liberal issue. I mean, a lot of the conservatives uh, in the UK, they, they like reclamation of land. They, they want to conserve uh, the, the wildlife because, you know, believe it or not, they actually like the country which they live in as conservatives. 
So, yes, you can't just say, oh, empires were only bad. They only made people's lives worse, because it's not true. You know, I, in 1700, the year 1700, a fifth of all global GP, GDP was in India. A fifth of all of it, of all gl global trade, practically, was in India. Like, <laughs> God, it was the richest nation for hundreds and hundreds of years. And what do the Brits do? They come over, they uh, remove some of the culture and uh, some of the people. But they still modernise India with modern uh, democracy, education, transport, and actually unifying it into a single country, which a lot of people <laughs> in India didn't really like because they wanted to be their own nation, but, you know, they can't live on forever. <laughs> and... You know, trade opportunities, medicine, as I've said before, democracy, particularly parliamentary democracy, if it's uh, the British. Of course, democracy back in the 1800s was a little different to what it is now. But, you know, at least in the British Empire there was some devolution and some devolved powers, like uh, South Africa was a self-governing uh, state, so was India, so was Canada by World War II, and they're only the ones I know, I believe so was Iran, or was it Afghanistan, who was also self-governing. So, yeah, by the turn of the uh, 19th to 20th century, Britain was a lot more uh, liberal towards their colonies, and, you know, as J.S. Mills, a, a, well, he's, he's sort of a bridge between modern and classical liberalism. He, uh, is largely credited for the harm principle for liberal ideology, which is, in a nutshell, if you're not harming anyone else, why should anyone stop you? Or if you're, if you're not uh, going to harm others or or yourself, you should be able to do that. And that's pretty much what everyone thinks nowadays. Like your your right to ask when your fist ends where my nose begins, <laughs> as people say. And even he, he supported imperialism because he says, well, we're not actually harming these countries because we do more good than harm. Like, uh, and, you know, sometimes we have progressive laws which were added into them, such as, as I keep saying, Parliament and more of a united society. And then there's uh, anti-slavery. It was uh, removed in Britain in 1833 entirely. Uh, and then the Royal Navy did a lot to uh, bring other countries into sub submission and... and and end their slave trade as well. So, you know, who knows? Maybe without the Royal Navy, slavery would have gone on for a lot longer. And if it wasn't for European nations sending it in their colonies, uh, those tribes and those nations would have kept slavery going for years and years, which I think... They probably would have. But, you know, it's not all good, as some people who I've 
seem to try to say it. Because obviously, the people of those countries were largely oppressed. I talked earlier about trade and opportunities and economic opportunity. They had nowhere near as much opportunity as what their colonizer counterparts had. Like, yeah, although there was no legal segregation or formal segregation in the UK, but there were but if you were black, you were unlikely to get very far in life. You were unlikely to get get to be anything more than a servant. Because, you know, it was... And oh, I should rephrase, black and Indian, for example, because they are different. You can't just say, oh, my not ethnic minorities are the same and they all face the same problems because most of the time they hated each other as well <laughs> like yeah if you were irish you wouldn't you definitely would have fated, faced discrimination in the uk uh, most likely if you were indian and african as well like just because the people in charge didn't do it explicitly, and it wasn't explicit. Doesn't mean that it's that racism isn't there. Doesn't mean that there weren't oppressed uh, peoples in the empire. Like, and tribes having to sacrifice their own their their own lives and their own culture for something which. Uh, they don't really agree with. And sometimes there's regressive laws. I pr- spoke earlier about the abolition of sl- of slavery. Well, how about uh, anti-homosexual laws? Since there is a relative amount of... Uh, amount of evidence to suggest that... Uh, being gay in some parts of Africa was acceptable or at least tolerated in, as I say, some parts of Africa for a very long time. So the idea that LGBT is a uh, Western idea, well, really, if anything, it's the opposite. It's a native idea with, and the West portal on homophobia. So, yeah, and so-called protection, like, okay, they would have been protected from other European countries, but does that ex- does that uh, excuse that European country from def- defending them? Like, really, it, if everyone just cleared off things would have been a lot better uh, morally for the people living there. But, yes, and it's written by the victors, especially in antiquity, like how we know almost nothing about the Celts of uh, Britannia, almost nothing about the Incas and... uh, and other Native American tribes and um, like the American continent and South American and Carib- Caribbean tribes and peoples, we know hardly anything about them, largely because uh, empires would come over, use use them for mostly their economic gain. Although later on in the twentieth in, for example, the 20th century, it costed Britain to have an empire, and it was, it wasn't actually profiting. So, the idea that it's only for economic exploiting, exploitment, it's not entirely true. But, yes, the sort of older empires, like the Spanish or Portuguese in the 1500s, it's not, 
it's not uh, to be desired to be a subject over those empires. But, yeah, overall, I'd say imperialism, although it's not exclusively a force for good, it's not really a force for evil either. Because, as I kept saying at the start, people's lives did improve. Like, yeah, they would have improved over time anyway, but it is arguable that because of the European, not only European of course, there were the Ottomans and the Chinese and the Japanese and uh, some other native empires and the Persians and uh, all other bloody empires. They also did it and they also did largely the same thing as every other one. Uh, perhaps it can, it can be said that they pushed society further than what it would have drawn. So, but if I had to make a judgement, I would probably say in hindsight, although if it happened to me today, I would have not liked to be, to have a foreign troop on my land. Uh, as William Pitt the Younger says, if I was an, Amer an American, I would have been a a uh, revolutionary, if there was a foreign troop on my land, I would never lay down my arms. Never, never, never. So, you know, a bit ironic for him to say that whilst he allows everyone, his troop, to be on foreign lands. But, you know. But if I had to say, was it good or was it bad? I... Honestly, I would probably say good, really, because, you know, it's in the past. We can't really change the past. I, like, I'm not necessarily glad it happened. But I think in most cases, especially in the uh, 20th century, the good sort of outweighs the bad. Which really is a shame in itself that these nations and these cultures aren't seen as uh, entirely successful. But, you know, that's just how it is. Now, I've been talking about approximately for an hour. I, uh, I will probably end it here. It's... For the best, I think, that I don't go on talking again. Especially since my bloody brother is going to come round any minute now, probably. So yes, I will end this here. And thank you for listening so far. If you have been, I don't think anyone does. But if you have, then... Hooray, you you are either insane or for some reason interested in me again. Uh probably insanity. Ah, oh, it, see it's funny because of the name of the podcast, huh? That that wasn't intended. But any I I've forgotten to say all these episodes. I think I said it once, and I also haven't checked checked it. But if if anyone listening does have a suggestion of what I should talk about or any suggestions in general, you can either leave a comment on the video or you could email me at boutofin at gmail dot com out of in at gmail dot com yes so thank you for listening and 
Goodbye, I will see you.